Mm-hmm. Greetings to everybody who signed on in the Zoom fashion. We are going to get started very shortly. We're waiting on one family member to join us and also connecting the Facebook Live. Just in case anybody gets closed out of this, if you have friends and family who are trying to watch and it's, it's blocking uh, and saying that it's full at any point, please go to Force Trajectory Project. That's F-O-R-C-E-D, next word, trajectory, T-R-A-J-E-C-T-O-R-Y, next word, project, on Facebook, and it will be broadcasted on Facebook Live on that page. Again, for trajectory project page. Mm-hmm. Yep, we're going live. We're live now, so and we're now live. Uh, folks should be able to see it on the Facebook page. Okay. Perfect. All right. So we are officially inside of our starting time. We're just waiting for one more family member. I want to thank all of the family members we currently have on the call. Everybody looks really amazing. And we are so happy to have you with us. I'm going to introduce myself and my partner at this time. And then we'll start introducing ourselves while we're waiting for Victor um, to sign off. All right. So Once again, I want to say thanks again for everybody for being here and logging on in these very crazy times. My name is Oja Vincent. I'm the co-founder of the Force Trajectory Project, which is forcedtrajectory.com. This is a project that has been going on for more than 10 years now, almost 11. We have been amplifying the voices and the narratives of family members of people who have had their lives stolen by state-sponsored terrorists. That is to say, police murder and all kinds of state-sponsored terrorism. So today, we have a number of family members with us to talk to the public at large, especially young activists and those who are beginning to become politicized in terms of guidance and leadership. We believe that a movement needs to be led by the front line. And in that case, that means the folks that wake up with this every day and go to sleep with it every night. And that's who we have on this call today. And so I'm going to go ahead and let everybody introduce themselves one by one, starting with Yolanda McNair from Detroit. And once again, thank you for being on the call. Hi, everybody. I appreciate you coming out. Well, tuning in. My name is Yolanda McNair. I'm the mother of Adesha Miller. Um, my daughter was killed one day before her 25th birthday in July, on July 8, 2012, by a Detroit police officer who was off duty. She was at a party at his house. Um, just simply out celebrating life. And it ended in her death. Uh, depending on which witness statement you want to believe, 15 minutes or 45 minutes after my daughter arrived, she was dead. Mm. But the fact is, they waited 25 minutes to call 911. Mm. And out of 40 people at a party, only one call was made. Wow. Since that time, I've been fighting for my daughter's justice. The office w- officer was sat at a desk for two and a half months and then mm. sat back out on the street free to kill again. Um, I'm the president and one of the co-founders of POST, Protect Our Stolen Treasures. We're here in Detroit. We have six chapters from Detroit all the way to Oregon. Um, We are going to open up some more chapters, but we are out fighting for everybody's justice, not just helping people who lost their loved ones to police and murder, but some that, you know, lost their loved ones in the street. And we're out here helping people psychologically, as well as helping them to find their feet financially. That's it. All right, I'd like to add to the introductions as well, if we could say your loved one's name. So each person, if we could say their name three times up here in the introduction, we'll do it again at the end. We do want to acknowledge we have uh, one guest that was not able to make it today, which is Marion Hopkins, Ray Hopkins, excuse me, um, coming from the DMV uh, region, which is Delaware, Maryland, DC, excuse me, DC, Maryland, uh, Virginia area. And so we are sending love out to Marion 
and we know that she's here with us and we're with her as she um, handles what she needs to handle today. So go ahead with your loved one's name, Yolanda, and let's say it three times. Adesha Miller. Say her name. Adesha Miller. Adesha Miller. Adesha Miller. Say her name. Adesha Miller. Miller. Say her name. Adesha Miller. Adesha Miller. Thank you. All right, and uh, I hand it off to Marissa. Hi, guys. Um, thank you, everybody, for who's tuning in for us, the host, to the host, and also the other panelists. You're all in private family, and it's never easy to do. My name is Marissa Guerrero. I'm from Golden, California. I'm here today because my brother, Michael Barrera, who you guys can see behind me on this slide, uh, he was killed by three years ago in our hometown. He was killed um, a very similar way to George Floyd's death as he was, he had that same knee to his back and officers on top of him. Um, he was also tasered multiple times and uh, used a him and died a uh, death like that. Well, hold on, Marissa, I'm, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. We're just having a problem hearing you on this end. I don't know if you can move a little closer. Okay. Right over for us, please. Is that better? That's much better. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry, guys. Um, so my brother died a very violent death as well. And is the hearing okay? Yeah. Okay, and so I've been here the last three years. My family, none of us, we have not gotten justice. My brother's last words were, I can't breathe. Um, this all happened while he was handcuffed, too. Um, so we know what I know what these families are going through. Um, I'm here today because I've just been over the last three years, been the voice for my brother, been meeting a ton of other impacted families across the nation, and nothing's changed. I've only been here three years and some of these families have been here many, many years. So um, right now we're just trying to do what we can. I've been trying to get my brother's story out there and connect with other families for now. I hope we can take this much further together as we're all fighting separately for justice so hard and still not getting it. So um, I respect the other family so much. Thank you guys for being here. That's all for now. All right, we're going to say his name three times. Could you lead us through that? Michael Barrera, say his name. Michael, Michael Barrera. Barrera. Michael Barrera. Michael, Michael Barrera. Michael Barrera. Michael Barrera. Okay, one more time, say his name. Michael Barrera. Michael, Michael Barrera. Barrera. All right, thank you guys. And I'm gonna, going to pass it on to the Bell family. Uh, good evening. My name is William Bell. I'm the father of Sean Bell. The young man in December 2006 was about to get married and he got uh, murdered actually. I ain't gonna say, you know, he got murdered. Uh, 50 shots by the police, New York City police. And it's like a, I don't know, it's hard to even talk about it, to really be honest with you. But, you know, it was one of the tragic things that you'd never want to see. It's one of the worst things in life. But we got to keep going on. And like I say, I live in New York, which is not a chaos now. And it's just, I don't know, it's so much you want to say, but you can't say because it hurts so much. You know, I'm gonna be honest with you. You know, that's how I'm feeling right now. But right now, you know, Sean Bell, that was my son. You know, he was only 23. And and like I say, he was, um, it, with bullets, 50 shots. You know, the other, the other when they murdered him. So. Hmm? Oh yeah, November 26th. 25th? 2006. 2006, right, that was the day that he was murdered. You know? Actually, be 14 years coming up. And Thank you so much, Mr. Bell. If, we could, if you could lead us through saying his name three times. Sean Bell. Sean, Sean Bell. Bell. 
Sean Bell. Sean Bell. Sean Bell. Sean Bell. Thank you. And, and uh, if you could, if you could pick somebody else to go and introduce themselves, right? Well, okay. Who's there? I don't see the names. I don't see who's there. Oh, okay. Victor. Victor. Yes. Right on time. Oh. Yes, Victor. <laughs> you got the. You got the floor. All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Victor Dempsey. I'll change my name in a second. Um, I'm the brother of murdered slain Delron Small. Uh, my brother Delron was murdered July 4th, 2016, uh, which they dubbed the Brooklyn Road Rage Incident. He was mm -hmm. murdered by an off-duty officer. Uh, I don't want to say his name personally, mm -hmm. uh, but my brother was coming back from a 4th of July cookout uh, with his whole family in the car. Also, my three-month-old nephew at the time, and his girlfriend, and an officer was driving erratically for blocks, blocks on blocks. Almost made my brother crash two times. Uh, they came to a stoplight where literally my brother was around the corner from his own home and in front of a family barbershop. And he seen the officer in the car that kept cutting him off. Uh, and you know, as any man would do to protect their family, he just got out to say something to him. Mm. And he never got that chance. He never got to say that he was stressed or whatever he was feeling during that time that he's driving his families in the car. So instantaneously, as my brother got to the car, the officer shot him three times. Mm. No talking, no conversation, no question, no nothing. He shot him three times. The worst part about that whole scenario is going through the trial process and understanding what unfolded that night. My brother possibly could have lived had he rendered some type of emergency medical service to him throughout the trial. And I need to be grabbed because I need folks to understand how serious this is and how much it haunts us, all of our cases. But my brother bled out. He drowned in his own blood from internal bleeding. Huh. So even hearing that during the trial was big. So I'm fighting every day when everyone hears, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. My brother couldn't breathe, but he couldn't speak because he was drowning in his own blood. So that's, that's, that's the quick version of my brother's story and what happened. And now I'm just here every single day fighting with families, fighting for justice. Unfortunately, we did go to trial. Officer was charged, but he was actually acquitted. And the reason why I do this work till still is because I know he got an acquittal because unfortunately, jurors, the community, our people, our peers, they don't understand. They don't understand the laws. They don't understand how to interpret these laws. So when it comes to a trial, you have to figure out if they're actually guilty or not. It's up to me now to educate community members on these laws. It's up to me to educate community members how to interpret what's being said during these trials. So I stand today fighting for my brother every single day and not just my brother, every other family, not just the families, but every black and brown child that walks this world, world today. So I would like to leave everybody and say my brother's name, Delron Small. Delron Small. Delron Small. Delron Small. Three times a charm, Delron Small. Delron Small. Thank you, Victor. If you can pick somebody else. To introduce himself. Uh, I'm not sure who went already, but let's go with Petra. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me to be on the panel. I, um, my name is Petra Wilson. My husband was Rex Wilson. Um, he was a Marine Corps vet. Um, he served five years over in uh, Camp Pendleton, California, graduated out of um, MCRD, and um, he was murdered in 2016 for, by Las Vegas um, Metro in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, you know, it's, a, it's definitely um, not anything I think anybody can comprehend on uh, what that means to have a justified murder. Um, but, you know, I, um, I guess it's, I'm, you know, it's, it's definitely been a lot on my mind recently. And every time we hear of another, of another murder, we, we do what we do and we relive, we relive that day. And I guess that's kind of what I'm feeling right now as of today. Um, my husband is a father of nine. 
He was a, a businessman here in Las Vegas. He sold real estate for a while. He worked for LexisNexis. He worked with lawyers. You know, he worked as a car salesman, kind of a jack of all trades. And he had a pretty insane sense of humor <laughs> that, um, I, you know, it uh, it's very missed. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, watching, what we woke up to was watching and hearing that he had been executed. Um, that's really what we heard on the on the news that day um, through Facebook. Facebook travels a lot faster than regular news today. And uh, we watched a line of events and traced a line of events through other people's posts to find out what happened because my husband was a John Doe. Um, he was identified as a white person and as an Asian person. And uh, on his, uh, when I contacted the coroner's office, they couldn't find him because they had him identified Asian. And, um, which was surprising because I always thought he looked more, um, you know, Mexican than Native American. He's a member of the Ogallala Sioux tribe and um, he was chased down by 39 vehicles and um, illegal pit maneuver, pit, new, pit, oh, sorry, pit maneuver happened and they, he was shot 36 times. So, um, I appreciate your being here and giving uh, impacted families a voice. I appreciate everybody who's in attendance, and I hope that this is a uh, good learning opportunity for everyone. Um, thank you, and I'm going to pass it to Katrina. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, we oh. need to say his name. Three oh, times say his name. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, say his name. Rex Wilson. Rex, Rex, Rex Wilson. Wilson. Say his name. Rex Wilson. Rex Wilson. Rex Wilson. Rex Wilson. Rex Wilson. Say his name. Rex Wilson. Rex Wilson. Rex Wilson. Thank you. Rex Wilson. Hello, everybody. My name is um, Katrina Johnson. Rex Wilson. <laughs> My name is Katrina Johnson. Um, I am the cousin of Charlena Lyles, who was killed June 18, 2017. Um, she called the police for help um, to report a burglary shortly after they arrived. She took uh, seven bullets to her 100 pound pregnant frame, died in front of three of her four children. Um, we are almost at the three year mark. We are still fighting for answers of which we don't have any. Um, justice is something that I do not think that my family is going to receive. Um, and I just, uh, it's been a really hard week, um, and I just stand in the gaps with other families, helping them, um, because I know what it feels like, um, to lose your loved one, and we are united, and we are a family because of our loved one's blood shed that was spilt out in the streets by murder from police officers. Um, say her name, Lena Lyle. Lena. Charlena Lyle. Say her name, Charlena Lyles. Charlena Lyle. Say her name, Charlena Lyles. Charlena Lyle. Charlena Lyle. And I'll pass it to uh, my sister, Shantae. Hey, hey, hey. Good evening, everyone. Can y'all see me? Can you, can you guys see me? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. Um, today is, has been a day. Um, I started out on 71st and Chappelle trying to do a press conference that led to kind of sort of protest. So I'm still kind of mentally trying to process all that. But anyways, my name is Shantae Needham. I am Sandra Bland's oldest sister. Um, Sandy was, Sandra was arrested on July 10th, 2015 in Prairie View, Texas, and later taken to jail um, for failure to signal a lane change is what um, Officer Insania said. And on July 13th of 2015, I received the phone call that she had allegedly hung herself in the prison cell. 
Um, the grand jury did not find anyone guilty. And Officer Insignia, well, Insignia he only got um, to be removed from the force and he can't be a law enforcement officer in Texas. Um, it's a very sad, it was a very sad day. It feels sad, almost five years to go and it's still going on. It's just really sad. I live in the western suburbs, about 35 minutes outside of Chicago. And if we could just say her name, Sandra Bland. Sandra, Sandra Bland. Bland. Say her name, Sandra Bland. Sandra, Sandra Bland. Bland. Say her name, Sandra Bland. Sandra, Sandra Bland. Bland. Thank you. Um, has everybody gone? Sheila. Just Sheila. I pass it to Sheila. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to say thank you for having me. And um, my name is Sheila Banks. I'm the auntie and godmother of Corey Jones, um, who was killed October 18, 2015. I represent my family, Banks family, and Corey's mother, Anita Banks, who lost her life to breast cancer in 2015. 2006. It was 10 years prior to his, his death. Corey was um, coming home from a, he plays in a band in the evenings and he was coming home from work and he started having a car problem. So he pulled over on, on Interstate 95 waiting for a tow truck for assistance. A police officer came over, a police officer came over and Newman Raja aggressively, within minutes, he had shot and killed him. We'll never know what happened that night. Um, every day we live with the pain of, um, of his death. And needless to say, like everyone else has said, because of what's going on now in the world, that pain is magnified. Um, I just want to do a brief timeline of our case. <clears throat> on November 12, 2015, Numa Roger was fired from the Palm Beach Garden Police Department. June 1st, 2016, he was arrested and charged with manslaughter and attempted first degree murder. On June 3rd, 2016, he was placed on house arrest and asked for every privilege that he can ask for, that he can think of. On, on um, May 7th, 2019, we went, to, we went to court and he was found guilty uh, with a jury trial. In May, April 25th, 2019, he was sentenced to 25 years in jail. So as we sit here having this, um, this event on Zoom, he sits in jail and we're really, really grateful. Um, but he continues to ask for appeals. Uh, most of them have been, de they've been denied thus far. But though we, though we received justice for him, we're still, we're still fighting, we're still fighting for justice. So I just ask for everyone to keep all of our families in prayer. I am the founding president of Live, Serve, and Care. It's a nonprofit organization that helps families and mothers that, are, that have been um, affected by unnecessary gun violence. Say his name, Corey Jones. Corey, Corey Jones. Jones. Corey Jones. Corey Say Jones. his name, Corey Jones. Corey, Corey Jones. Jones. Say his name, Corey Jones. Corey Jones. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our panelists today. Um, I just want to remind the audience, once again, we did receive a comment in the chat box uh, around somebody who seems to have it twisted. This is a space that is open for all family members of all ethnicities to be treated with total equality. Uh, this is a collective movement that is inclusive. Also, I want to emphasize one more time, the purpose and intention of this meeting is to allow young activists and people who are newly politicized in these times right now with what we're witnessing to come into direct contact with information from the true leaders of our movement. These folks wake up with this issue every day and they go to sleep with this issue every night. 
And so these folks don't have the choice, and many people do, to not have a uh, part in this struggle. Therefore, they are the front line, and they are the leaders of this movement. Uh, we don't want anybody. We don't want anybody to get it twisted. The job as an activist is to activate the front line. That is your job as an activist. It's very simple. And so that's why we're here today. We're hoping that these family members can inform where our movement goes from here. We know a lot of people are angry, confused, and without direction. And so this is our effort to supply that. And so now we'll get started with the question. The first question is, how did you find out about this latest incident of state-sponsored terrorism? And we'll go to Yolanda McNair for the beginning of that answer. Okay, I apologize. I got to go pick my daughter up. Her ride flaked out on her. Um, I got a, a message to check out my Facebook, and it was sent uh, directly to me. Um, watched the entire video in disbelief that this young man was being held there with all those people around. And they let that little sawed off thing stop them from helping him. Um, I understand the fear of the cops. I understand the fear of being shot. I understand the fear of you being next. But there's me, Yolanda. I could not have stood there and watched that happen. And I'm not trying to tear them down for it. I just know me. I couldn't do it. Um, but that was the most horrific thing in a long time that I've seen, to watch him die slowly, to see him, his last thrive for life, to see him take his last breath. Yes. That was the most angering thing that I have seen in a long time. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, um, since my daughter's death, I've kind of done a reverse because I had a bad temper blow up quick. My kids are worried because nothing gets me there. That got me there. If I, you know, I got invites to come to Minnesota, I just said, um, God don't want me there. You know, not now. That is the mo was the worst I've ever seen. You know, because it was slow. It took a long time. He put a lot of thought, energy, and weight into that. And there's no way to say that he didn't have intent. I understand that it's hard for them to prove first degree murder, but guess what? That's exactly what we witnessed. And anybody that wants to chime in, you're more than welcome. Uh, this is Shante speaking. I saw it on Facebook and I had caught a glimpse of it and immediate, immediately I went into prayer because all I could see it in the moment was, I can't breathe. I instantly prayed for the young man's family, and then I prayed for all of the families that would be triggered by this incident. Because although we're still in the healing processes, um, we're still trying to heal. Each time one of these incidents occur, it re-triggers, I'm sure most of us, if not all of us, all over again. Um, so I had to go into prayer. And I took my page down for the rest of that day because I was like, that's just way too much. That's way too much. Okay, I'm done. Uh, yes, I just want to say a couple words about that. You know, when I saw this, I saw it on CNN. I was just having to change the channel, and I, it came on. And I heard this young man saying, clearly, I can't breathe. You know, with this guy with his hand in his pocket, you put more weight down on an individual when you put all your weight down on one knee. And that's what he did. He actually almost tried to break the young man back. You know, Nick, and the whole thing too, you think about it, they checked him and he had no pulse. And he stayed on for an extra two minutes and some change. So what you tell me, that to me, that's first degree murder. There is no, you know, by accident or just said, he said, okay, I let him up. He didn't think about letting him. He actually looked down at him and made sure he wasn't breathing. So how bad is that? I say murder myself. You know, that's what I think of it. And I agree with everybody else, like, you know, how bad it was. 
you know, and how you know how sad it looked for that young man to die. On. I mean, you literally saw him his last breath, and that was that's a painful situation. So, that's all I want to say about. It. Thank you. Um, when I woke up uh, last Tuesday, um. I did not know when I clicked on that link that I was going to see a murder. And I have not been well since that day. Um, and I, quite frankly, I don't know, but I am pissed off. And I just, I'm, I'm tired. I am so, so tired of seeing bodies killed at the hands of police. Black bodies, white bodies, native bodies, bodies, they're people. They're just like, we're just being killed. And it's like, enough is enough. I'm so tired. All right, thank you very much. Um, we are gonna move on to the next question. But on that note, in terms of uh, what comes up when one is, sees something like this, I'd like to take a minute out just for a brief second of self-care. We're just going to take one really deep breath. If everybody can join me watching and all of our panelists, I'm just going to lead you through breathing in and breathing out one time. The idea behind this is when you breathe in, just gather up all the energy and emotion that you have. And when you breathe out, we're going to exhale everything out. Okay? So here we go, breathe in and out. Okay, good. So hopefully we're a little centered now. And uh, I wanna take a quick second before we get to the next question, just to shout out all the family members across the nation that might be watching right now. I know we have Devin, Denver Terrence Jr. in the house. I know that we have Quentin Hayward who's on. And uh, I want to especially send a shout out to all of the family members out there who are watching uh, all ethnicities and all communities. And so now with the next question, given what you just were talking about, Katrina, um, this is going to be an open question, but Katrina brings it up in terms of the impact of even seeing something like this happen. So when you find out about an instance of state-sponsored terrorism, are there methods that you use to help with the reactions of that outcome? Are there any methods that you use to regulate or control the amount of news, information, and images when they air on TV or the internet? Um, I think, I, mean, I know for me, um, it's like after my cousin was killed, I didn't think it got any worse than that. Um, and it's like you almost want to stop watching, but you can't stop watching. Um, you know you need to, um, you know, do your best to help um, the family if you can, and you, the people around you to be able to rally, um, you know, in solidarity for that family um, because they've become a member of the family that no one's to, uh, the a member of the family that nobody wants to be in. Um, and I think that, you know, a part of you is a little bit desensitized after a while because you continue to see it over and over again. And I don't know um, what self-care really is because many of us are still fighting for justice for our loved ones. And if we aren't fighting for our loved ones, we're fighting for other folks' loved ones. And so, like, there is no Breathe. We have no time okay, to breathe. Right, hold on. You're breaking up. You're breaking up. Can you hear me? We have no peace and sleeping well under those conditions. You can't rest well. Um, there's no peace in continually seeing this along with the trauma that you already have from your own loved one. And for me, um, as of lately, when I see 
when these type of things occur, I have to detach. Facebook, I, I'm on Facebook all day, literally. I guess like my second job. Um, but when I see these things come across, these murders come across my Facebook, I have to come off, at least for the rest of that day. Um, I will never, ever watch the videos because that will be just too much for me in this moment. And I don't know if I ever watch the videos because even um, seeing the picture of the man's knee in his neck, it took me back to the officer's knee and my sister's back and her saying, I got epilepsy and he said, good. So I can't, I just cannot. But some other things that I use is I journal because I can put my, my anger on paper and no one else will see it but me. And, and that's how I deal with these types of uh, horrendous murders. Uh, thank you so much for those answers. And I just want to remind once again, everybody who's watching to please employ your focus and deep listening skills. This is valuable, valuable information that informs our movement. And that being said, we're going to move on to the next question, which is, in an instance like what occurred in Minneapolis, what is the first thing you would advise the community to do in support? What is your message to the community? And we're going to go to the bell for that one. Uh, you guys, uh, I understand, you know, we're all upset. It's natural to be upset because it's, it's a routine thing that happens so often. But one thing I would try to tell the community, for what you are doing to yourself, actually, you are destroying yourself, your own property. You don't own it, but that is your property. And what you, and you're making a good reason for the police to hurt you. Now, I'm as a parent that went through this. Now, if a person get killed because of them, uh, because they're violent, whatever, and the cops are shooting, which we have heard, you know, just shoot them. Now, do you imagine that? How would you feel that, you know, here's your son is dead. Now you get, other people are getting killed because of, uh, of what's going on, because they're not thinking. I know they're outraged, but they're not thinking. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a bad situation, I understand. But the whole thing, you got to think. Like I say, you need a little organization out there to control it, because if they don't, it could be more deaths. And then one, if I understand there was one that got shot, just being a, a protester. So we are fortunate that there's, there's many more. Now, how do you think them, uh, the parents would feel about that? You know, they're sitting around and say, oh, man, my son causing these people to get killed? Well, that, now that's, that's another load on the parents and the family. So how are they going to stay in there? You know, and it's, it's, it's a terrible situation. You know, the best thing I tell the community, please, it's good to support. It's good to protest, but let's keep the violence down. Because you're protecting yourself also. Not only, you know, your property, but yourself. You know? And if I could say something, if you don't mind, um, supporting the community is we always have to remember to stick together and to do what's right and to vote. And even if you do vote, just don't vote. Once you vote, continue to be on the backs of the, of the politicians because we are the ones who put them in there to make a change. Not only protesting, rallying is okay, but to a level that it's on one accord and there's no violence. But the changes have to be put in writing. Laws, bills, but as my husband said, the laws are not for us. So we as a people have to continue to keep on these politicians to make a change. So things can eventually change. We don't know when, but we pray that one day well, God will change everything that's going on right now. Thank you. And along with what um, Mr. and Mrs. Bell just said, I think that um, for us, even though we receive justice in the community, and, you know, our focus just became broader to try to help bring change in our community. And not only just change, I mean, we can change, we can change laws, but I think what's going to really be needed is their hearts of man need to change. There's so much evilness out there. And mm. I think that it's going to be really important that the hearts of man change because mm. it's too many of our loved ones are dying because of violence. Mm -hmm. And this fight is just, it just became broader when I met so many other family members that had the similar experiences. And I know with Corey, mom, my sister, you know, growing up with her, she was a fighter. And in her honor, I honor her and I fight because she fought as a single parent. She, she fought, you know, just teaching her kids respect, 
how to respect the law, how to respect yourself. So, you know, we must, we, you know, we can't just get, we can't focus, like like Mr. Bell said, that violence, it has to stop. Non-violence, non um, I mean, I'm totally in support of that. I'm totally in support and having a voice. But um, until we, I mean, I think, you know, we just got to focus on change. And I think we just should stand there, stand still until we get the change that we're looking for. Our culture needs to change. We need accountability for the police officers, not for the police officers, just, just with our community. But the police officers need to be accountable to one another. If they're one seeing doing something wrong, speak up and say something, have a voice. And, you know, and one thing we did was that um, as a family, you know, with the community, we, we, we had dialogue, we sat down, we talked with the police, you know, department, you know, they, they, um, they, you know, they, they prepare, they, pre I'll, I'll say this, they prepare, they prepared a seat at the table for us. And we sat there and we made a difference by sitting there dialoguing and looking for change and implementing change in our community. And it made a difference. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else want to respond to that question? All right, so we'll move on. Uh, uh, Oja, can I do it? Um, yeah, it's just real brief. Uh, I wanted to say something that happened here today um, in one of the cities of Michigan. It's Southfield, Michigan. The police chief put it on himself to create a, a, a new rule uh, where officers that don't intervene when they see another officer doing wrong, you get the same penalty. Hmm. Um, it, it, you know, is is late in the game, but he's trying to get ahead of the curve. Instead of waiting on a politician to introduce it and make it happen, he's put that on his people. Um, so now, if an officer is in the process of committing a crime, and let's just be real, that's what it is. They're committing crimes, um, uh, physical harm. Uh, uh, display of their weapon, threats, whatever. That officer's duty is to take him in or her in. Not let that officer continue to be on the street. Report, not only report, but arrest them. So we're going to see where that goes. But at least, you know, and I'm going to say he's African-American police chief. Uh, that see where this goes. And uh, his city used to be 90% white. Um, and I'm, I'm only saying that because they did a horrible job when it came to people of color. They were so prejudiced and everything was condoned. Now that they have an African-American police chief and they've had an African-American mayor, they've become a little more diverse. Uh, their ears are open. They are making strides. So I, I do commend them on that point. Uh, so, as far as the community goes, yeah, they can stand down on all that violence because that, that mixes the message and, and changes the focus. And that's not what we need. It's right. hard enough to get people to listen. So, please don't change our focus. That's it. Thank you so much for that, Yolanda. And the city you're talking about is Detroit, correct? Yes, correct, Detroit. And so, we're seeing some development. Um, in reaction or response to the pressure that's being applied. But when you folks saw the rioting that followed the incident, um, what was your reaction and what was your response? Um, so, I mean, my reaction was, I mean, I don't condone it, um, but I also don't condemn it. I mean, I understand you know, um, like Dr. Martin Luther King said, you know, riots are the cries of the oppressed and people are feeling like their backs up against the wall. They right. have left and they're just angry. Um, and I think that, you know, that is what is being displayed. And when you have rhetoric coming from out of the White House, like we are seeing, it just fuels that. You know what I mean? And it's it's really um, driving some of these things that we're seeing in all of these other cities um, because folks are just tired. And I don't, I think that, you know, making it about looting and vandalism is a distraction from what the real narrative is. And the narrative is you guys are tasked with re, um, protecting and serving folks in the community, yet you are killing those folks. 
And I don't want to hear anybody talk about any split second decisions. We don't need you to make split second decisions. We need you to make the best decision in a split. Mm -hmm. And that is a that is a difference in someone's life. Um, I want to add into that too, you know, as far as the writing and the looting, same thing. I have the same sentiments. I don't condemn it, I don't condone it, you know, and I really feel like, you know, I was out there with the protesters, you know what I mean? It starts off peaceful. It's just, but I'm still seeing the reactions from the protesters. When these officers come out, I'll be honest, when we was out there the other day in Harlem, you know, we were trying to protest peacefully by voting officers. We were marching in directions where we felt like they just couldn't block us off because we were trying to avoid confrontation. You know what I mean? So now as they're trying to, uh, 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 keep us down and, and muffle us and try to keep our protests or make us protest the way they want to protest, that's when folks start acting out now. Because we're here because of your actions. We're out in these streets because you keep killing us. We're trying to protest peacefully, but now you're in front of us trying to stop that too. So now we have to direct energy somewhere else. So yes, I don't condemn it, I don't condone it, but at the same time, if it's a means for them to listen, if it's touching their pocket and hurting them financially is gonna make them listen, by all means, we're going to make them listen. You know, I'm not going to sit here and say, you know, it's, it's hard and it's rough to see. It is hard and rough to see, you know, even though I don't want to say it, but it's hard. But I'm, one thing I will not do, though, I'm not going to condemn anybody publicly to everybody else to divide us again. You know, George Floyd, watching what happened, I can't even say what happened, but watching what happened, it outraged people. And we also have to understand that there are other people there that's outraged about other racial issues, aside from police brutality as well. And folks are fed up. Folks are fed up. That's my piece on that. Um, hey guys, so I was gonna add my feelings towards that too. I feel the same as the last two people who have said that um, not condoning, not condemning. And I gotta say, I've been to big protests before and a lot of times, like he said last, Victor, you know, the protesters are doing it peacefully and then the cops are the ones attacking and assaulting the people. I've seen it in Sacramento. I've seen a woman ran over by the sheriffs. Um, friends out there right now are getting shot by rubber bullets. These are not the people that are looting and rioting. These are the people in the streets doing it peacefully. Um, a kid got shot out here. so. Um, also seeing them do it undercover, them show up to the protest, the, the undercover cops, or there's very obvious to spot if you've been to some by now. So I try to remind people that we need to also be aware that that's happening too. And a lot of, you know, they get caught sometimes as well. Um, I'm just going to end with, it is disheartening as well to see people that don't ever speak on police brutality or the killings at all come and share their comments about how mad they are because of that, but they've never spoken on the murder. They're not mad about the killings that are happening to our loved ones that we're shouting out about every day. So that's all for that. Thank you guys. Okay, thank you guys so much. If anybody else wants to weigh in on that, that's all good. Um, we are receiving a few things in the chat box. One person is saying that last night in Oakland, the cops attacked protest moments after taking their kneeling photo opportunity. And so we're seeing the indiscriminate violence being perpetrated by the police and um, at, at no end all over the country right now. Thank you for that in the chat box. All right. And so we're going to go to our next question, um, which is, given the state of affairs right now, um, what do you see as the next step? And we're going to start with Victor Dempsey in New York City. Uh. I'm not going to lie, it, it is a hard question to answer, right? But from what I've been seeing everywhere, not just New York, what I've been seeing everywhere, short-term next steps for me, we need to organize organizers. Honestly, we need to organize organizers. The reason why I say that is because what I've been seeing in the city, and while we've all been seeing it, right, we can say, let, let's look at LA. If we look at, I mean, California, We've got protests in LA, we've got protests in uh, San Jose, all over, right? Different clusters of protesting, large clusters, <laughs> 500 
each each spot, you know what I mean? Even in the city. But what I realized was, even though people mean right and they, they want to bring folks together, our messaging is different. Even when folks talk about the rioters, the looters, the protesters, and all of this stuff, just it's because I think the centralized message is not compacted yet. Everybody, we, we all know that we're pissed off. We all know minority folks, black, brown, whoever, we're pissed off, right? But now as we're trying to express that, it's too many different messages out there. So I think short-term next steps for everyone, organize the organizers, reach out in your local communities, find out who's organizing these rallies that we're seeing every day. Somebody's posting locations somewhere to meet, you know what I mean? If we can get to these folks, tell them, hey, let's work on some messaging. What issues, like I said, I know for a fact all this protest is not only police brutality. I know in New York, we have folks pissed off about housing, being discriminated about housing, being discriminated about jobs, you know what I mean? Being discriminated, just going into Starbucks and you can't sit there. So it's, it's, I think it's so bigger than that. Not saying police brutality is not a big issue, but I think in a way we have to organize everybody so we can put all these issues together and come up with our demands. Right now, the people, the government's waiting for us to say what we want. It's not just the, uh, 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 it's not just following through the criminal side of all these officers who's murdered our loved ones. Even if they go to jail, I'm still not going to be happy because you know why it's going to happen again. Our demands needs to change, like uh, uh, Super Value Bell said and Bell said earlier, legislative change. We have to get folks to understand how that happens, how that works. So organizers, please, if you're there, reach out to us. Reach out to uh, family members in your neighborhood. We've all been through it. We've all sat through trials. We're all waiting for trial. We're all fighting to get it to a trial. We know how it works. So yes, that's the short-term goal for me, organizer, organizers, man. Uh, thank you very much, Victor. Um, once again, just a reminder before people uh, answer next, we're going to go with Petra and then Katrina, but first, I want to remind the audience that when you go to Force Trajectories, uh, Force Trajectory Project's page on Facebook and scroll down, you have one flyer that covers this entire event, but then there, there are the individual flyers for each family member that is featured. So please go and get the information from those flyers. And like Victor is saying, link up with an activist organization that is working hand in hand with family members that are directly affected today, tomorrow, the next day, sometime soon. Find out which family member you have, a brother, a sister, a cousin, a mother, a father, aunt, an uncle, grandparent, that's in a different town. Find out which organization is in their town. If they're interested, connect that. Reach out. These folks are the true leaders of our movement. And on that, we'll go to Petra with a response. Um. And thinking about that response uh, or that particular question, um, for me, it, it seems that it needs to go through many different levels, but it needs to go through a legislative level as well. Um, and I think that part of that, that step that starts to get things into a legislative and, and move it into a federal, a federal bill that holds officers accountable for certain types of actions also has to do with the voting and getting, um, getting people like, like us into positions because um, I come from South Dakota, and I don't know how many of you have seen um, the issues going on in South Dakota with just the roadways, but there aren't, there aren't enough, um, you know, we, what we see is a primarily certain type of um, uh, group that is serving office. And, um, you know, I'm not gonna call, call them out, but, uh, you know, I think having people who are coming from our communities in um, high, high, uh, such as senators, judges. I think judges are extremely important. Um, you know, uh, having your children grow up to be lawyers and being able to understand, you know, uh, what these communities go through. I think that's a, a big one, but the federal legislation I think is completely lacking. Um, I know that people talk about it, but it seems to be, it just seems to never go anywhere. And the, um, you know, when you talk about police officers and they, um, they have their own code, they have, they have their own code and they should be held up higher than the rest of us because that's what they swore to do. You know, they swore to protect our communities. So they should be held at a higher rate, you know, of responsibility and accountability than the rest of us. Um, I think a lot of times people just say, oh, we just need them to stop. But no, it's, they need to be held accountable at a higher level. 
um, you know, they they need to be able to see how they impact communities um, because they don't, they aren't made to to recognize that today. That's not how I see it anyway. They um, they see it as a free vacation sometimes. That's that's the the gist of how I felt like when um, I hear about administration leave with administrative leave with um, with pay. Um, it's kind of, uh, you know, it's kind of upsetting to, to see that that can happen. And, uh, and then you see them back on the street patrolling in, in areas of your community, unless you choose to move, you know, so uh, that's what I, I feel is the next step is legislation. Um, I, I, I also agree, but um, here in Washington State, um, we passed Initiative 940 um, for de-escalation training and police accountability. And they're still killing us. Um, people are still dying, and we have a whole new and we have a whole law. Um, and it's not enough for the the police officers to get fired and to be arrested if the prosecutor isn't going to do their job. You know what I mean? So I mean, we have to be able to, you know, uh, to make sure that the prosecutors do their job as well um, because a lot of times that's where the breakdown happens it's with the prosecutor not wanting to prosecute officers who murder who murder folks in the community and you know and then the other half of that is these police unions. these police unions and the things that they during collective bargaining that they bargain away um, that you know make sure that our communities are not safe have to be addressed because the police chief can be an officer and the union can rally behind them and that officer can get his job back so what the police chief is doing at the end of the day don't even matter unions and prosecutors um, you know, we have to, we have to work together to change things in that department as well. Uh, thank you very much. So being brought up in, the, in those answers, important to summarize this for folks that are in the audience is that in working for legislative change, there are layers of different gatekeepers that are responsible for these cases. We're talking about the district attorney. First, we're talking about the governor. And here in Nevada, I know that we uh, don't have the opportunity to elect a just DA anymore, uh, but we do have judge elections coming up, which is a six year term, and that's the next layer is trying to get at the judges. So please identify in your area which are the politicians in the legislative branch of government locally that you can appeal to who has a platform that is about human rights and justice and support those candidates, you know, get with, get with the rest of your community and organize. So thank you for that. Um, the next question is going to be, what are the added challenges you see around this kind of incident during the pandemic that we're experiencing today, if any, and what are some solutions? And for the answer to that one, we're going to go back to Victor, who is in the epicenter of the virus here in the U.S. in New York City. Victor, if you could start us off, please. No problem. Uh, so what I'm noticing as far as challenging is, um, kind of piggybacks to what I said earlier about organizing organizers, a lot of challenges that we're having is knowing who's who. That's one, right? On, on the ground challenges is knowing who's who. We've been seeing a lot of folks that, you know, I mean, everybody knows this type of work, the folks who care about this type of work, you normally see the same folks hammering it. You know what I mean? It's kind of a working circle, so to speak. But a lot of our challenges, man, is, is really staying, staying organized. Like it starts off organized, but then it falls off. And the reason why that's important to me is because, and I always come back to messaging, because everything else is a distraction. I know uh, one of our family members said it earlier. Everything else is a distraction. You know, on the news, they want to talk about the 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 looting and all of this stuff, and now they want to start posting up all these officers taking a knee and all of that stuff, whatever. That's just a distraction to me, you know what I mean? So really one of my, my, my problems that I'm seeing is staying focused, staying uh, 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 vigilant, and also consistency in our messaging and us coming out, um, how we're bringing folks in, and just staying connected with them. You know, that's something that's been really, really hard right now. Um, 
It's, and then on top of that, we're still in a pandemic. You know, we're talking about this because it's a major issue, but we are truly still in a pandemic. I'm not going to lie. Even when I was out as big as I am, you know, folks see my Instagram, I have my mask on, then I have it down because I'm pissed off and I'm trying to scream at somebody. And then subconsciously, I'm like, oh, wait, <laughs> put that back on. You know what I mean? And it, it's hard. It's hard. You know, you don't know. It's different when you can look somebody in the face, kind of feel their energy. But we're all masked up. We're all worried. We're all kind of on edge. So it's been kind of organizing everyone to kind of have that consistency and a structured, organized type of thing. It's been really hard to do amidst this pandemic and how fast things are moving. Things are moving really fast. And it's moving so fast, it's hard for me to keep track of who's doing what. You know what I mean? Even to the point where in New, in New York, we actually have to keep track of what protests are happening, where, and who's doing it, because a lot of folks mean bad, unfortunately. A lot of folks mean bad. So what we've been doing out here is trying to vet whatever flies we see, reaching out, trying to make sure that these people are the real deal, and then letting folks know, yeah, you, you can go there. If not, we'll tell them I wouldn't approve of that. So really, the pandemic is, is kind of hurting how we normally would uh, address a lot of these issues. Thank you, Victor. And now to Mr. Bell. Excuse me, Mr. and Mrs. Bell. OK, I'm sorry. I kind of um, said, <laughs> can I speak? That was on the other question. So when the young lady spoke about legislative, which is true, Right here in New York, um, 18 families got together in 2015 to do an executive order by Governor Cuomo. He just signed it for a special prosecutor. And she's right about special prosecutors, judges, police officers all work hand in hand. So prayerfully by having this special prosecutor that will cut out the DAs in each borough of New York so they could take the cases on. They took a case on that we had and one of our um, sisters said that the prosecutor, special prosecutor did a great job, even though the person wasn't convicted, but they kept in contact with the family. So that's the most important thing. Once you get these legislators to do what they need to do, keep in contact with each other. And thank you so much. Um, thank you for that. So we're going to return back to the next question. That was my bad for not catching that when you, when you chimed in. So thank you. Uh, very valid point. Of course, we need to be careful when these legislative bodies put together special uh, investigations, committees, often they're investigating themselves. So it's it's kind of a trick in, in a way, and we really got to look deeply into that. So we're going to return back to during the COVID crisis, what kind of adjustments have we had to make? What kind of challenges have they been? And we'll go to Yolanda McNair in Detroit for that one. Um, I don't, uh, some of y'all know that I have a, a campaign that we do monthly called Defeat the Fire, where we're in front of the prosecutors or the DA's office calling them out on their inability to do their jobs, pointing out their <laughs> failures and where their shortcomings are. Um, it's been difficult to do that, of course, because with the, with the social distancing and whatnot, people are not showing up or they want to show up and they, then they overdo it. Uh, you know, instead of staying distanced or, or whatnot, and it causes a bit of a problem. But like Victor said, just trying to vet out genuine people who are truly an activist and not somebody who is either looking to raise themselves up or uh, make themselves important by uh, associating themselves with us uh, or our loved ones. Um, and then it's also this... Uh, conversation that needs to be had between the new and the and the vets you know um here in, in detroit black lives matter really doesn't exist anymore because of uh infighting they destroyed themselves um but we have different groups that you need to reach out to you know like we have uh the D detroit 300 that's a group of men that patrol streets uh, they do work with the police uh, when it comes to trying to find out where the, you know, chop shops are, where, where, where somebody who's accused of shooting someone or whatever, you know, trying to help the neighborhood stay safe. Um, but there is also um, maybe, I want to say five other organizations within the city. It's just trying to get them to work with us 
and I feel that we're trying to take them over, you know, because it's so big, people being killed by cops, that they feel that if we work with them, they got to understand, work with. We're not trying to take you over. I got enough of my own people. Yeah, the organization grows, but you need to work with others, you know, in order to bridge this gap that's going on. And people need to realize you're not giving up anything by working with someone. Mm-hmm. You only gain. And and that's the that that's been hard because people don't want to meet, they don't want to talk, you know. Some people are overly afraid. You know, it's like, okay, you're doing all the right things, so why do you still think that you're gonna catch something if you're way over there and I gotta yell to you? Um, but you we just need to get past all the stuff that the government has tried to make us fear to work together. That's it. Um, I want to jump in real quick. I wanted to add something to the previous question also about working with families. I know Petra addressed it as well. But I really want to say too, and I want to read a comment because I see there's family members uh, who are part of us on here as well, and they are chiming in. And you know, I'm not trying to single one out because there's so many of us, unfortunately. But uh, Antonio Williams, man, Tony Williams. This young man, he was uh, actually, I want to read the comments, but be brief on it. Uh, this came from his mother, uh, Gladys Williams. Justice for all the victims, I lost my son on 9-29-19 to NYPD shooting my son down on the street. And all he was doing was trying to catch a cab. It's huh. a tragedy for all who lost their loved ones to such senseless killings by the hands of people who are supposed to protect us. You can never get over this pain. Let me explain something. We all feel the pain for somebody's murder. Antonio Williams, I played football with this dude and rock him. He knew my brother before he died. I knew his family. I played football with his father. When I heard that man got killed, it tore me apart. It was literally like my brother being killed again. And the reason I want to come back to that question, because I think it's so important, even with this pandemic, we had another case in Brooklyn, Matthew Felix, young man was in alleged car chase, gunned down in his car, 19 year old kid. It's so hard in this pandemic to reach out to families because what we pride ourselves in doing is, and, and we all know this, it's very important that as soon as something happens, we need get to get retrogrew folks to those families yeah. to nurture them, to guide them, to protect them yeah. too at times. Because we all know when he's, look at George Floyd, and I'm only using this not to slight anybody at all, but tell folks the importance of families being with families. There's other organizations that support the families, but there's nobody, I don't care who you are, there's nobody walking this earth that understands the grief unless you're a family member. There's nobody out there. And just to see, like, even we got nine families right now just as panelists. That's not to slight any of other families. We are still here for you. But during this pandemic, too, it is an added extra layer of confusion because we can't be there the way we want to. You know, Valerie Bell, everyone knows we've all gotten phone calls from other family members at two in the morning because we can't sleep. We're still crying. Or we need to kind of talk to a mother needs to talk to another mother to feel that pain of a son. A brother needs to talk to another brother who lost it. So I, I, I'm always trying to reiterate to folks, man, even if that family don't know how to get in contact with us, as a community, as a people, we need to point them in the right direction as well. And we're not gatekeepers. We don't impose on folks. We're just here to give you the best advice possible because I know for a fact, if it wasn't for Cynthia Howell, Gwen Carr, Hortensia Peterson, Nicholas Hayward, all these families in New York, Constance Malcolm, to come to me and my sister's aid, Vanessa, Beth, everybody, we were comforted. It was easy, not easy, but it was easier to deal with the pain because we were able to talk to folks who went through it. So yes, this pandemic also stops us from being able to do what we like to call rapid response. So anyone on this call listening in, please follow us, stay in contact, or, 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 or at least look out for what we have going on because it's important that we protect each other. Thank you, Victor Dempsey. That was amazing. Um, incredibly said for all the activists out there, definitely pay attention. This is going to be up on a Facebook page. So if you're missing something, go back and watch the rebroadcast, the rerun, whatever you want to call it. And we're going to move on to the next question. Um, in the last, oh, sorry about that. The next question is actually, why is it important 
for families with the same experience to be in touch with the family when this stuff happens. So we're going to go to Petra with a response, um, and then we'll have others follow up. So we, we started to answer that, but let's, let's go in. Um, I really liked what he, uh, Victor was when he was talking about the rapid response, because, um, you know, our, exp our experience for my family, um, like I said, we, we fought, found out through social media, he was a John Doe. Um, so when, when it all came down to, um, when they real when we realized who it was and, and the police, I contacted, I actually contacted the police and I didn't have, um, I had like my kids and I, but we were already on in a state of shock by the time we figured it all out, you know? Um, and so that kind of stayed pervasive. And I'd say the, the support from most people lasted. Um, I, you know, there were some people who have continued to support us for a long term, but uh, like the large um, support kind of started to dissipate pretty, pretty quick, probably within 30 days as things go on and people live their lives. And, you know, um, I think, being in touch with people with the same experience has, um, because part of part of the experience of being a, a impacted family or an impacted member, I think, is the fact that you don't realize like you're in shock. You don't realize that your, you know, that your mind isn't functioning correctly. Your memory starts to go. You're, you know, you're you're always in a state of stress. Anxiety levels go up, and all these things, and you have nobody walking through it with you that understands it. And so that even creates more stress. And then everybody kind of thinks you should be back to normal after a short time. And you don't have anybody to talk to about that. And then depression hits in. And, and then, you know, um, maybe, maybe you're, you're, you're just trying to navigate people from using some type of um, um, medicinal factor that isn't normal or you know all these things and I think one of the one of the things I was grateful for was um, we accidentally came into contact with Nisa and she started to put us in touch with people who have the same experience and just like this you know this kind of has this like being um, anxious over this whole thing with the protesting being here on this panel it kind of is just like a little cathartic it kind of brings you back to a centering to hear that you're not here alone and you're not dealing with what's what's happening alone and you know i i can't even imagine you know like um if i hadn't found this where i would even be because you know it gave me it gave me a place where i felt like at least they understood what i was going through and they weren't judging me you know they weren't judging they weren't judging anything they were just letting me talk and be and participate and and then since then I've been able to do that same thing for other people and hopefully um, you know as time goes that becomes a larger collective of people and and we're even looking at what can we do for kids you know we've talked about it in our own group here locally in Las Vegas um, the FU4J group like how do we how, how do we do something for kids because in the midst of all of this when this happens we forget that there are people behind these people who love them and they cared about them. And, you know, we had to protect people from all the horrific comments people make because they believe they're, they believe that these people deserve it or they're criminals or they come up with all these scenarios and, you know, cause it's not even always just, it, it just goes completely out of context in every direction. And, you know, you, when you have kids, you got to protect them from all of that. And you're trying to deal with it yourself. So having people to do that, to walk with you, hold your hand and tell you it's okay the day you feel anger or you hurt or you're frustrated or you just can't even get out of bed because that's really where you end up sometimes is getting out of bed is the biggest chore. Taking a shower is difficult and telling me that it's okay and having somebody who says, okay, I didn't hear from you for 24 hours. Where are you? You know, that was major for me. And so um, I think that's the importance of knowing that these families can come together regardless. This is because this is, this isn't about, you know, race. This is about humans, us mm -hmm. as human beings and being good human beings and being able to, to be there for each other. And because we all have the same pain, I think, Yesterday, somebody said blood is blood, you know, and we do, we all bleed. And, you know, we, we all feel that, that intense pain the day we find out our loved ones. And I, 
you know, I, I've been searching to see where this family is for George Floyd, and I didn't see anything until this morning. His brother came on and said, please stop the violence, that his brother wasn't about that. And, you know, and that was just like, I just felt like my heart just like beat harder because I just felt for this person so much. And I think, um, I think we can all relate to that. And, uh, you know, so for me, knowing, uh, being able to identify family members and being able to contact them and being able to pull them in and, and um, hold their, hold them, no matter how long this takes, because it never ends, you know, it never ends. So that's, that's how I feel about that particular question. Thank you. I don't know if she's next. Uh, okay, so I was going to share something on this question as well. Um, when my brother was killed, the police quickly offered a false narrative, as they normally do when people are killed by police. The community, we did not have support. We got the opposite, just like Petra shared. Shared there were many bad things, horrible things being said about your loved one after we were already in such a vulnerable like disorientated, I can't like thinking back to those days. It was what they do to us families is torture. It's they do so much to us, and we are already grieving and in shock. So, my family and myself personally, I've lost a lot of friends through this. I people that were my acquaintances, things that I did before in the communities, or jobs and stuff. All these people in my community that know me and my family. You don't get no support. And, um, you know, I kind of after started realizing how this stuff works. I started connecting with other families, and it has been so helpful. I would be so alone. I would probably be going more crazier than I feel some days. And I have made an effort to reach out to families as I see them come. And it's sad, but we can't keep up with all them. We can't keep, there are so many of us. So, there are hundreds, like, I know hundreds of families now in California. There are, there are a lot of families out here. We've done different things. Um, we had two legislative changes in the last couple of years in California on the police. They have not made any difference. Meeting with those families and also just different events, meeting with the families, it's a, it's weird because we're all there for such a sad reason, but you feel the love, you feel the support, and you feel everybody else. You feel their pain, but you also know they understand you. And I've had other experiences as well as many people I know that are impacted families with the activists in their communities, the organizations, the people trying to take advantage that are not genuine. So it's very important for us to stay uplifting each other and how you mentioned earlier too, you know, when you hear, you need to, we need to let, we worry about the other families. If they're connected with, with good people, and that's because we're the ones that truly care. Um, I just know the first person I met when she, her husband was killed by police, similar way to my brother, and she says, you're now a part of a family that nobody wants to be a part of. So it's hard for me to see families, infected families, and people not being uplifted by activists and organizations in their communities that are not directly impacted because they don't have that blood from their family that has been taken directly like ours. So, um, yeah, that's hard for me to see, but it's happened to me directly in my community. Um, it's happened to others. So I, and I, I must say, I've been seeing a lot of families speaking up on this, even just today scrolling through my, my feed. I see a lot of families speaking up on this. Mm -hmm. and the thing I just want to end with is that us here fighting, like, I'm thankful that I'm here and that I can speak up to my brother because there are a ton of victims that nobody is speaking up to that. Whether their family doesn't know that they were wrongfully murdered and they believe the police, or you know, it just got hidden. So we, we're here fighting for all of those people too that don't have a family member pushing for them. So I, I just make it clear and with people everybody like all of us are deeply impacted and um it's important for us to be with one another that's all guys thank you uh yes i want to say something real quick about that because what really gets me 
when you're dealing with people that I said the outsider, because that's a family we, we don't want to be in. But when you're dealing with other people, the first thing they say to me, what burns me up, you'll get over it. They say time will, time will heal. Don't worry about it. Just think about it and time will heal. How would you know? Time don't heal. My mother been gone over 40 something years and that's still painful. Now, how are you going to tell me what happened to my son that I got murdered and with 50 shots, I'm going to heal overnight? They said, well, it's another year. You should be all ready to, you know, just put it aside. You can't. When people going to realize that you can't do that? You know, and those are the people I stay away from. I can't deal with them. I know three people. I have three, four friends, and that's it. You know, and I be, you know, and, and they understand. But other than that, if it wasn't for this family here, like you said, which we hate to be a part of, uh, what would we do? You know, who you talk to? Because people put you in a space that you don't want to be in, in a mood, in an area, like, oh, no, my mind is going crazy because he's going to tell me to hell with my son, and you might, get, might as well get over it. You know, that's the way people think because it didn't happen to them. Until it happened to them, you know, they don't want to talk to you. But when it happened to them, you can't get rid of them. You know, it's a sad situation, but that's life, you know? And thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Um, thank you, Marissa. Um, and so the audience is hearing the deep isolation that family members experience in the aftermath of a murder of a loved one, uh, which is insult to injury. There's often the changing of the narrative we heard about, um, the greatest Journalists in the United States, in my opinion, Mumia Abu Jamal calls that media violence. That is a form of violence when someone is criminalized in the media immediately following a state sponsored murder or murder of any type, any, any, any life that's stolen. So we're hearing about that. That's why we're on this call to get the insight and the wisdom, the direction of these leaders of our movement. And that being said, we're going to move into the next question. In the last five years, police violence in the media has erupted multiple times around nationally recognized case at a greater frequency. How has this added vis visibility of the issue influenced or changed how you've been advocating for your loved one? And for that, we're gonna go to Sheila. Oops, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I think um, I think I kind of sort of answered that question early on. <laughs> similar, um, it's just it became um, once meeting once meeting so many other family members, it um, it no longer became um, just an isolated fight about Corey. It became a fight for all families, all family members. Um, I think that. Um, Meeting, I, I can recall when we when we initially went through our our, our incident. If initially, we didn't know what to do, where to focus. But I remember um, Vicky Williams. She's out of West Palm Beach. She lost her son through gun violence, police gun violence. And I remember I met her the night at the um, uh, at Palm Beach Gardens um, at the at the um, one of their town hall meetings. And she was there, and I met her that night, and she held my hand. From that day on, she has never left my side. So I think it's really, really important to stay connected with families that have gone through um, similar situations. I think um, that um, we all need each other. We, we all need to stay connected to one another. Um, and like I said, you know, just just um, just continuing to fight. I mean, it's, it's a fight. It's a daily fight. Um, it's a daily pain. It's a daily fight. And just, you know, we just have to stay in the fight. Thank you very much for that. Does anybody else want to chime in on that question? As this has been in the media more, how is it affecting the struggle? So, um, yeah. Is it okay for me to say something? Yes, indeed. Can you hear me, Mr. Bell? <laughs> Just dropping the phone. It's frozen. Can you hear me? What you did? Oh, I don't know what happened. <laughs> yes, I can. I can hear you. Go ahead. Go ahead. And any any time like oh, okay. I, oh, anytime you want to anytime you want to chime in, this is your panel too. Don't feel like because we set something up with a, a certain amount of responders, if you really have something to say, let me know and, and it, it's your it's your mic. Go ahead. I know, I know. Um in reference to um 
like Victor says, you have to be with, you have to organize, be with organizations and meeting these family members that helps me to, to go with, go with them through their pain. Like we all say we don't want to be in this family, but meeting them, going to their functions, meeting so many mothers from different states. We laugh, we cry, but we think about our young ones. What would they be doing if they were still alive right now? I don't like talking about the 50 shots. I like talking about the life my son lived when he was living and the life he could have lived if he was still here. So being organized, being an organization, keeping in contact with mothers and fathers, being with my family who's kept me, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I'm a firm believer, my church family, my husband stands by my side. So if you have people like that to be with you, you can carry on. And my main focus for me, what I've done, I never sit still. Because I believe if I would have sat still, I wouldn't be here speaking to you today. So keep moving, doing the things for not only yourself, but the people around you that needs your help. If anybody wants my phone number afterwards, I could give you my email address. My ears are always open. Me and my husband, we're here to listen. There's so many cases in New York and all over. And we extend our heart and yeah, ears to anyone that wants to speak with us. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you, Mrs. Bell and Ms. Bell also. Um, yeah, so here we see exhibited the great solidarity from coast to coast all over our country, all over the world, really, that family members have for each other. And that's been one of the most beautiful things that we've witnessed as activists. Um, we're going to go to Yolanda for an additional comment on that question. Um, what I do is um, just flat out network. You know, um, aside from Post having six chapters in different states, I know people all over and uh, I conversate with them. You know, I find out, I ask them flat out, do you know of any families that haven't been in the light, who haven't had anybody helping them? Just put them in touch with me. I work with two different radio uh, shows that feature people who have lost their lives to police murder. Their families get to tell that loved one's truth. And I do that every week. Um, it's a matter of reaching out to people and letting them know that you're there. You know, a lot of folks, they don't know we're here. They have no idea that we do what we do. Because let's just be honest, the press is never going to tell them. They're not going to tell them because then they, they would have to start telling the truth. And they're not going to do that either. So it's a matter of networking. Use all the systems that are available to you, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you know, uh, do videos, go on YouTube, whatever it is that you have to use, whatever vessels are out there, make them yours. I tell everybody, find one reporter that'll tell your truth and then favor them. They will always be there for you, no matter what. They will make certain that your words are heard. Um, we just have to figure out and fine tune the message and then get it out to everybody as something that we agree upon. You know, we have some activists out there that are just so hell bent on get the cop, get the cop, get the cop. And some that some of us just say get the system. And we need to understand they're one and the same. But if you get the system, you ain't gotta worry about the cop. He'll never make it. He'll never make it into the system. So that's where we need to make the changes and that's what we need to be focusing on and that's where our messages need to be going. You know, yes, we need to make congressional changes. We need to, we need to change bills at how officers are governed. We need to change bills at how officers are punished. Because as far as I can tell, last time I checked, they're just a person. They put on a badge and wear a uniform and carry a gun. I do all of that. But I'm still Yolanda. At, no matter what I do out here, I'm going to still be treated as Yolanda. So we need them to understand if your name is Paul, guess what? You Paul. Paul messed up. Paul got to deal with that. We all have to make that change. We have to be on the same page. We can't be trying to say my message is more than yours. Your message is more than mine. Put them all together and make it work. We got to be the first ones to show them that it can work. That's it. 
Thank you. Uh, Victor, did you want to say something? His sound's not working right now. Oh, nobody's sound is working. I can, I can hear you. hear you. I hear you. Hello? I, I can hear you. Oh, okay. Everybody's sound is working. I don't know what just happened. Why you keep going Uh my bad. Okay, I was muted. But Victor um seemed to have dropped off the call. Something was going on with his uh cellular device. So we're hoping that he joins back up. In the meantime, we're gonna move to the next question. We are hearing from our network of impacted families that some families are being turned away and disrespected because they are not black. What is your response? How can we remedy this situation? How can we create a more inclusive movement and at the same time be aligned with the Black Lives Matter movement and the movement for black lives ecology? And we're going to leave that open. Um, I mean, I guess I'll start. I, I... I've been hearing this a lot lately, and I am appalled at the fact that um, people would think or um, that just because somebody's not black, that their loved one doesn't matter. Because everybody's loved one all bled red blood, they're all dead, and like someone said yesterday, dead is dead. And it doesn't matter whether you're black white, indigenous, or whatever. And the reality of the situation is indigenous folks get killed at a higher rate than black people. And people don't even understand that. So, you know, I think that everybody needs to check themselves and they need to get behind every family. I don't care if you're white. Your family member died at the hands of people that are supposed to protect and serve. And shame on anybody that thinks any differently because that is not how families should be treating families and that is not how anybody else should be treating anybody who has lost their loved one to a uh, state-sponsored violence period and i i do not condone that and i haven't met any family members that you know i work with that that um are condoning that and i know that there are some black lives matter folk that have hijacked that movement to use it for their own cause and they are causing dissension within families and shame on them and they need to be called out and shut down for their actions i thank you very much yes, for that. i'm going to say if you could hear yeah, me that yep yes i agree I agree with her and like every state, there's so many people being killed by police officers. So within your state, you have to get together with an organization who will be with you. And a person who can't handle the killing of their child is not noticed, is not known about. So they have to find somebody. If somebody doesn't wanna be with you, step out. Like Martin Luther King said, step out on faith don't wait for the staircase just step out so you have to be the one to make your voice heard you have to be the be the one to be seen we do not neglect reject anyone there's so many organizations that someone should be a part of if they can be a part of it so it's not about the color of your skin like she said someone do i know like she said a person is dead because the police officer killed them you have to be the one to go into these organizations to be with somebody. Like you said, nobody wanna be in this club, but we're, there are so many of us that we have to join together and be about DCC in order. Thank you. All right, thank you for that. Anybody else want to respond at this time? Um, this is Petra. Uh, one, of the, one of, this is kind of my experience when I first started coming around to, um, I uh, was kind of joining things. Um, I kind of, I, in one particular um, arena, there was, um, I think, um, primarily, I think we had a Black Panther speaker and we had some other speakers that were showing up. And um, 
it kind of took a direction where originally it was supposed to be like encompassing and eventually we began to um, notice <laughs> I think me and a few of the other people that were there that we were kind of being um, not really included like we were allowed to be there but we weren't really we weren't really part of this all of a sudden like it wasn't about the families it became something else and we weren't we weren't um, we just didn't didn't feel welcome and then event and I and the other person that I saw there was a white family there was my family and then there was a few others and I noticed that our like we like we where we started sitting eventually we were all sitting in the back and I don't know if we even like subconsciously did it or if we realized you know it just happened but somehow we kind of end up kind of congregating in the same area ourselves and it was very hard like even on break time nobody was coming up and talking to us um you know it was it it just felt like people walked around nobody said hello and i think that's another important like if there's somebody there at um if there's people at gatherings like having the ability to like come up and say having maybe assigned one person at the out of the organization who says hello to people um who kind of kind of is like a kind of a the uh, greeting people or get train other people to make sure that they're greeting people and maybe ask some questions of of um, just making them feel at ease because it's hard to do that. It's hard when you're in the middle of that um, that despair. It's hard to it's hard to reach out, you know, because um, and it, and it takes a while even for some of us to say, okay, you know, maybe I will show up at that or maybe I will do this, and to ha and to feel like um, because you've already dealt with race. I grew up in racist. We, we call it Racist City, which was Rapid City, South Dakota. And um, I watched, you know, I'm, I'm light skinned, I'm light eyed, and, but I saw, you know, I was uh, telling stories about how the first time I really realized what racism was, was when I was like six years old. And um, I thought maybe if I, grew, I raised my kids in a different place like this, that it would be different. And unfortunately, you know, we're very marginalized and uh, very invisible. Like there's many people who actually don't even know Native Americans still exist in the world. And so when you talk about them being at a, a sh shot at the highest rate, um, you know, it's there, but it's not there. Like we, we don't have, and I haven't seen, we have Native Lives Matter, but we don't have the same platform to go forward. And we don't have the same, um, I haven't felt the same, um, you know, uh, I haven't found anybody actually here in my area from Native Lives Matter. So when I go to something, I'm just going because this is what I need. Um, so to not be, feel welcome, that's devastating. That's devastating to a family. That's devastating to a person. That's de devastating to you who, who had to witness, you know, over and over and over for, for days on end watching as, a, as anytime you turn the TV or your phone or somebody was contacting you and you were watching the murder of your loved one on video, you know, um, because we all, that's what's today. It's, it's always in your face. And, you know, and, and then seeing this, it just repeats it. You know, the first thing I did in seeing this was I found myself thinking about my, you know, my husband and I found myself watching the videos again. For what reason, I can't tell you, but I could probably tell this panel that that's what I did and they would probably kind of understand, you know. So I think turning people away simply because we're already fighting racism, turning people away simply because you really don't even know that I'm Native American. <laughs> you know, you think I'm a, a white lady or whatever, you know, to me, that's just completely heartbreaking, you know, because that's not what I wanted for my children. That's not what I wanted for their lives. That's definitely not what I, what I would want for anybody else. And I try very hard to welcome, welcome people, you know, and, and to do the best that I can to be just a really good human being. And that's what I would hope to get in return. So I hope that people who are or doing these organizations realize like, you know, some of us even have, some of us even have police officers <laughs> in, you know, in our lives. And even that makes it difficult. So, you know, I hope they they kind of take a step back and realize, you know, um, you aren't walking in my shoes completely. You only are, you are seeing what my, what I'm about to walk. 
So thank you. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that, everybody that shared. We're going to go to Victor. I know, um, but just in one moment, I know that some folks are going to have to jump off really shortly. So uh, Marissa has to go, and then Shante will. That's right. Huh? Is that right, Marissa? Are, are you on, or you, do you have to bounce? Marissa? Can she hear me? Okay, well. Just to say that um, I'm going to let Victor answer, but if anybody needs to leave, um, and everybody's doing a really great job of keeping us posted over here, so thank you to all the panelists. But if you need to leave on a meeting, I know Shante has got a meeting coming up. I want to say to you, thank you so much for being here with us and on behalf of our audience and all of the young activists and not so young activists that are in attendance. Um, we salute you and we salute all of you. Uh, thank you for your time, and we definitely will be following up with you soon. All right, Victor. Thank you, and God bless you guys as well. Thank Later, you. Shante. All right. See um, ya. Right. Yeah, now, um, all I'm going to say in relation to that is I remember one of the first big events I did with the families. Uh, actually, OJ and Nisa, you guys invited us out to Detroit, where I met Yolanda in person, a um, lot of the families in person. That was so powerful for me going out in fellowship with numerous families from across the nation that share the same pain and grief that I do and having that weekend to spend time with everyone and really connect. It was dope. There was no colorism within Fams United there. No colorism whatsoever. We all shared that same experience and that same struggle and we are bonded for life. We are family for life. You know, and I know we always say that this is not a club we want to invite people in. We don't. I wish we could turn up the membership applications. You know what I mean? But for me, man, even think about me, I would be damned if I'm at any rally and someone told the family member they can't speak. I don't care what color they are. It's not going to happen around me. The reason why is because I know, and you know, it's not to slight any other organizations. Believe me, if there was one that I felt strongly about, I will call them out. But the thing is, we have to understand too, and this is part of the movement. This is part. We have to understand the inner workings when it comes to protesting. We have to understand the inner workings of filing for grant money or writing curriculum. All of that stuff is important when we're fighting. A lot of times we have to remember too, there's organizations that we can align ourselves with. They're getting grant money off our pain. They're getting these, 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 uh, uh, whatever it is that they're getting off our pain. It's simple as that. So, and again, I'm not slighting anybody because I think I've learned so much through the last few years that I've been involved. Um, I had to navigate through landmines, so to speak. And it's going to continuously happen because, unfortunately, killings are going to keep happening, you know? So my whole thing is when it comes to colorism, man, there is no color there, you know? And, 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 and it's not even always about, you know, black or white. It's not. It's about equality in general. I don't care who it is. If you're Native American, alien, it doesn't matter. If you're here, you should be treated equally. But I will say, though, the fellowships that we had, you know, the, the few years all the families got together, that's powerful within itself, man. Like, just having that fellowship, being able to share information is big. And to me, this all goes back to legislative stuff. Like, in New York, we have the special prosecutor bill. It took a lot to get that done. It took some rubbing elbows with elected officials or just infiltrating certain spaces to get that done, too. But... I mean, I, I can't even keep speaking of her because it's pissing me off that somebody would tell a family member they can't say something. You're out here because of what happened to us, but now I can't speak as to what happened to us. And I also wanted to add something else into this because I know it's hard. Like we all, we all know, there's so many families who lost their loved ones, so many. I don't even know every single one of them. But what I will say is this, I take pride in that, at least in a tri-state area, New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, I know every family member who's been lost. I know. I have to know. Being on the front lines, I will never slight another family by not mentioning their name. Now, we're human. We all make mistakes. But this core group of folks that I know, when we see these lists, you know how heartbreaking it is? I actually went to a protest the other day. I seen this young lady with two big posters with hundreds of names on them. Hundreds. And you know, I actually I stood next to her. She didn't know, but I looked through the whole thing. I didn't see my brother's name on it. It hurt a lot because I'm in New York City where he was murdered. So I tell people, if you really truly care about this fight, 
You have to do your due diligence to research what's going on. You have to do your due diligence to reach out to other impacted family members. You have to do your due diligence if you're planning a protest or a rally around police brutality issues. Bring the folks who are directly affected. Do not speak for me. I don't need you handing me a piece of paper to tell me what to say about my brother. I don't. But I do welcome strategic planning. I do welcome folks who understand the system that I'm trying to learn about so we can get uh, 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 the information that we need to fight. So I'm here for everyone following us, everyone that's involved. Please, and I'll reiterate it, reach out in your communities to folks who are directly impacted. You have to. So as far as colorism too, I denounce that. It better not happen around me. Anybody listening, don't do it. <laughs> That's my piece on that, man. All right, Victor, thank you so much. Um, yes, Marissa. Um, so yeah, I do wanna share just a quick couple of experiences that I've had on this topic. Um, it's happening again right now. I see with amongst families that I know, a lot of people are posting about it, but here I'm here in Sacramento and um, when my brother was killed, I jumped, jumped on the scene. I started getting out there meeting different organizers, organizations, activists, just going. And uh, I'm transparent because this is the truth. The Black Lives Matter out here treated my family like crap. And um, it was it was at one event that was after, uh, it was for the Stephon Clark protest after he was killed and it was very publicized. And I participated in those protests. And um, at one particular one, they had different coffins representing the different lives that had been stolen right there in California. They had a lot of that. So um, that included, you know, Mexicans, Blacks, and whites. Well, when uh, she had an issue, and she even posted it publicly on her private page, telling people, reminding them that, hey, if you're not Mexican, if you're not Black, you're not going to come and ask to say another person's name if they're not black. This is uplifting black people if you're brown. It's like just being clear that she's re referring to my brother and she was referring to me because someone who's seen me get there uh, asked them, hey, Michael Brewer's family's here. Will you uplift their name? And they wouldn't. And it turned into a big old scene. So I felt highly disrespected right there. Um, and I seen another experience like that in LA too. But the difference there, when I went to LA, 16-year-old um, Anthony Weber was killed by police. He was shot in the back. And I, that's the first, one of the first protests where I showed up. And I'm in Sacramento. That's across the state, too. And there was a lot of families there. There was impacted families, black, brown, and white. They all came. And I was so amazed. And I'm like, wow, all these families. I wish I was in LA. All these families are showing up for this family. And then uh, something happened on the mic where a man came up and he was looking at the white families and stuff and acting like it was them that killed this, like because they're the white people and then a lady got on the mic and she defended the family she's still a friend of mine she says you're not going to disrespect these families that have showed up while well, we looked at the cops that were lined up the la sheriff she's like those are all black and brown officers right there so that day really put into perspective for me that the bullying that I've seen go on in my communities, it's not okay. It needs to be shut down. And there needs to be some respect on our loved ones' names because they're the ones who are dying for the cause that they're working, they're claiming they're working for. So it was it's it's hard for me to see all my different friends who are impacted families posting about their experiences like during these last couple of days. And I thank the families who have spoken up and who are um letting it be known that that's not going to be accepted. And I feel like um, there's a strong in this activism community, there's a strong bullying culture that happens and there's strong of, hey, you can't call out that person for what they did to you that was really wrong because we need to look good. Like we're the ones that are holding the burden, we're the ones that are speaking out for our loved ones by ourselves and then we can't, we can't share our truth and that people are, it makes me wonder too, um, in Sacramento, there was a 19-year-old, Daryl Richards. He was killed after Stephon Clark was killed. 
and he was here in the same city. And I always, I wondered why Sacramento did not give him the same energy that they had just given this other man. So um, same community. It makes no sense. It makes me feel like they're going with the narrative of the media also where it's only just a couple, a handful of people are being killed. So we need to be talking about all of them. Um, that's all for now. Thank you, guys. Um, thank you so much, Marissa, and thank you, everybody who spoke. Um, well, we're going to move on to the next question. We only have two more questions here. So I want to thank you guys, too, again, for your time, because you guys have been hanging on for a while, been on for a long time, especially to the audience for listening. And um, Marissa, you want to say you're going to respond to this question, or did you did you want to say something right now? Oh, she's frozen. Okay. Oh. No, you're not frozen anymore. All right. All right. Let's ask. Okay, wait. So right now, uh, we've, we've got, uh, we're going to pause for a minute on our question list. We've got two more questions. We're going to ask for questions at the request of one of our panelists. Um, if everybody's with it, we're going to ask for some questions from the people. And so I'm waiting for those questions from the people to roll in, but we'll go ahead and address this next question, if that's all right. And we'll wait for those Q and A's to, to come in. Everybody good with that? Give me a thumbs up if you're cool with that. All right, work. All right. So um, this next question is a question that was relayed from a brother in the struggle who became like family to us, Nisa and myself, the Force Jetry Project, uh, whose name was Nicholas Hayward Sr. He was uh, the father of Nicholas Hayward Jr and fought for the life of his son for 24 years in Brooklyn, New York, and all over, his, all over the country in support of many other family members. So we definitely pay homage to him and all of the people in the struggle that we've lost who are with us in this struggle. Um, when I visited Nicholas, he was pretty sick. And uh, this was leading up to the national meeting in Oakland in 2018. Uh, when I sat down with Nicholas, I asked him, you know, we're going to do a presentation for the families around the country. What is the uh, number one thing that I should ask families to think about, to talk about with each other? And so I'm going to relay that question to you guys. He asked me to ask you and all the families, what is justice? Because everyone's always talking about fighting for justice. But this can mean different things to different people, especially those folks that are on the front lines. Nick emphasized that we need to define the word and that definition must come from the families. So if we can go around and if everybody can answer, just popcorn it, when somebody ends, somebody else come in, it'd be much appreciated. Whoever wants to start jumping. I'll start. Um, this is Sheila Curry Jones. Justice to me is when everyone in, in America is treated fairly, regardless of their skin color. That's what it means to me. Justice I'll go. Me. Go, go, go through. Oh, OK. Um, justice for me would be uh, people being held accountable for things that they are doing and harms that they are committing um, and being brought to justice um, and at least being tried for the crimes that they are actually doing. Um, that is some semblance of justice for me. Um, and I just think, I mean, the real, the real question is, is there really such a thing as justice? Do we actually think that there is really such a thing as justice? Because I think the system is working exactly the way it has been de designed to work. So, I mean, those are just my thoughts. <laughs> I could go on. Thank you, I'm going to uh, I'm gonna jump in on that because I honestly was going to say, I don't even know what justice looks like right now. But justice for me, honestly, is knowing that I one day 
I will be able to sleep and know my kids and my nephews and all the kids don't have to do what we're doing. That's my kind of justice. I need to go to sleep at night and not have a heavy mind and not worried about when I'm gonna talk to my, have that talk with my black boys. That's my justice. And get away to Isaac's fire, NYPD, but yeah. <laughs> No. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, yes, they say justice, like everybody's saying, what is justice? We really don't know, because we have no idea. Because like the court system, they got a certain law for us and a certain law for other people. So we don't have no idea, to be honest with you. But even you know how to spell it, you don't know what the meaning is. You know, so you know, for justice, like, he, like my man was just saying, more or less, I like to see my grandkids, my grandson, or my, you know, my granddaughter have peace. Be able to walk the street in peace without fearing the police officer or pull you over and you know do whatever to you, harass you for no reason because you got a new car, or you know because you you work hard for it, or your parents work hard to you know to help you out. You know that's the only thing I can really think of. Because justice, that's a hard word. <laughs> that is, believe it, it's a hard word. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anybody else? Um, this is Petra. I um, I think justice, when I think about what justice is, is I think, one, it begins in reform reformation of um, how police officers are um, brought on onto the force. Um, like for me, I think that, um, you know, I can look at my own children and I can't even imagine them having a gun in their hand. Um, you know, and so I think it's, it begins in how, how that's handled, you know, um, my own personal feeling is that, you know, uh, police officers are taught to shoot to kill, um, they aren't taught to, um, you know, uh, try to um, understand what that person's going through prior, and when they come forth, they, they come in with a, um, they're everything, they're God, judge, and jury. And they don't, um, they don't think anything, you know, they don't have any repercussions. So to me, justice would be, you know, where there's some type of re reformation and understanding that the, um, you know, that the, that the level, I mean, we're, ha we're handing children guns sometimes. You know, some of these, some of these police officers are, you know, uh, what, 20, 22, some of, some of them are starting training when they can't even legally drink or smoke cigarettes yet, but they're ha be being handed guns. You know, to me, that's just like total insanity. Um, you know, so it's like uh, taking a really, really good look at how how police force is even brought together, um, and you know, holding them accountable for the badge that they took. You know, um, at a higher level than the rest of us. That's 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 to me, and to be able to be able to know. I went to a panel, and I, and what's really struck me. Um, and when we talk about our children was, there was a retired police chief and he was um, a, black, a black man. And he says to us on this, as we're listening in this panel, that he teaches his son how to do a traffic stop. Because even as a chief of police, he still knows that his son is in danger during that traffic stop. And that he tells him exactly how to behave. And to me, that was super impactful as to what the world is like today. Because if you are serving on that police force and you still have to teach your son that, that is horrifically a problem, you know. So um, to me, justice would be when nobody has to do that. Um, so I'm gonna share justice for me. Um, I don't feel, well, what it means to me is I don't feel like our love, my brother will ever get justice. Um, I feel like the way that they've been stolen and have been done, um, you know, they kill them first and they kill their character and just so much further on. Um, so I found myself questioning, like, should I even say justice for any more towards these killings than the victims often? But a far fetched version of justice to me would be when the policing, how it stands and the system as a whole is a
polished and something better and real and that tends to the it, it serves to the people truly and it's not corrupted that's my far-fetched version of justice um i have sons too um i have so many extended families now that are my family the impacted families and yeah, I stopped believing in the justice part already. So that's my version. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. You know, uh, we have one final question. And I just really want to, I want to highlight something else that Nicholas used to talk about a lot um, in our experience. We, we started traveling around with Nicholas to meet other family members. And uh, he would always refer to the so-called justice system as the injustice system. You know, he said he doesn't see any justice. He doesn't think he's going to see any justice. Uh, and even if he does, somebody else is always defining it. So they're taking power out of our hands. And, and so I thank you so much for answering that question for the people. That's a question that we're going to continue to ask and that I would ask you to continue to ask yourself as the definition may change as time goes on or experiences change. So for our final question, which is seminal, how can we, how can we, the community, support impacted families at this time? How can we center families in this movement? And um, Yolanda actually had to leave, so we'll start. Uh, we want to honor uh, Yolanda for being here. Also, uh, the Bells who had to jump off, but we're going to go directly to Sheila Banks for the answer of this question. Sheila, you're muted still. Yes, yeah, yes. Now you're, now you're good. Yes. All right. <laughs> um, communities can support families by first showing that respect to them. Um, and I know when, in our case, from my, from my experience, when we were um, going through the trial, going through the in and out of court in the, in the courtroom, um, it was important for, for our community to show up. And I think that that's one, that's, that's, that is one, I mean, the protesting and the, the rallies, all that's great. But when it comes down to that courtroom, it's very, very important to have that support. And the family needs that support. They can support one another, but to get that outside support, that's vital. And I think that's, that's, that's one thing that, um, that the uh, community can focus on. Also praying for the family, showing love to the family. That's also important. Um, and if the family says that, you know, they want nonviolence, we have to respect that. I think I heard um, George Floyd um, brother today asking the community to stop the violence. You don't want to, you don't want to uh, tear up your own community. Let's not do that. And he, he was calling out for help. And I remember my father when we, when we had, um, when we had a couple of rallies, um, the first thing he did, he prayed like he always does because he's a praying man, uh, Bishop Sylvester Banks. He said that um, um, he asked for the community to help. He said, let's, let's, let's help, help, help the community. And he also asked the community to give, give the state attorney, give the police department, give them, a, give, give them an opportunity to do the right thing. So just whatever the family requests, um, I think that that the community should respect that. Thank I'll you. I'll kind of jump in really quick. Uh, community support. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. I'm not. I don't mind the protests and stuff, but I'm kind of number way. I want people to vote. I swear, to you, I want people to vote. I want people to understand how their voting power affects what we're currently dealing with. I want fa I want community members to reach out to families, reach out to groups, and get educated on the voting process, get educated on who the candidates are. I need community folks to get more involved in their community because I think knowledge is power and the more we know, the more we can be there for each other. And I really want to kind of put the other context to that is we even try to, you know, take care of the folks who are recording these type of things. Those folks need to be protected as well. Uh, so I think as, like I said, the more we learn as a community, the more community gets involved, 
we'll be able to do so. And I actually want, want to give a really good shout out. Um, I, I see her, she's been reaching out to me the last few days, Cynthia Simo. Thank you, Cynthia. She has been avid reaching out, asking how she can get involved, coming up with suggestions and ideas. That's what I like. This is a community member I've known her for a while, never knew she cared about these issues, and she's been going hard. I mean, I hate being annoyed, but I don't mind being annoyed for this. So yeah, community, reach out, work with us, educate yourself. We can educate you. We can point you in the right direction. But really, man, all in all, vote. We have to vote. Um, a couple things that I think um, are important are for people to not tokenize family members. Um, don't use them um, to bolster your platform um, because you see that. Um, you know, don't uh, use families um, so that you can gain proximity to power. Do not use families so that you can make a name for yourself and that's that's the biggest thing that I see a lot, um, and it is just it is ridiculous, um, you know. And I understand that everybody moves a little bit differently, but when you get to a place to where it's all about you, you have lost sight of the real mission and goal that these families and many, you know, all families all over are trying to achieve. And you make it that much harder for us. Um, you know, if you want to go work within the establishment and do whatever, I think that you need to have a level of transparency for family members. If you are putting on events, I think that, and you are asking impacted family members to join, you need to make sure there are safety plans and say, um, for family members in those events. If you cannot do that, then do not invite them there. Um, and I think that those are some of the ways that community and folks that um, are helping families can do um, for them. Agreed, thank you so much. There's so much wisdom and knowledge there with what you guys have shared. Uh, Sheila, did you wanna weigh in on this one again? Oh no, I just wanted to um, to give a, give a couple of shout outs to, to people that have stood by us, um, just a couple of people that have stood by us. Um, and even now, like you say, like, um, like, like Victor said, they're 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 still reaching out. Miss um, First Lady Mamie Kitchener out of West Palm Beach, and um, a retired um, retired um, Congress Lady um, Addie Green. They really really stood by us, mentoring us, mentoring my family. Uh, retired Judge um, Rest in Peace um, Judge um, Judge Rogers out of West Palm Beach. Also, he was the first black judge of West Palm Beach. But I just want to say thank you to them and thank you to my family. When you, a lot of a lot of people saw me out front, but I had my family supporting me, praying for me, holding holding me up, and I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, sister. Yeah, you better um, stop crying. You make me cry. I'm gonna be mad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm no. messing with you. No, I love you, girl. <laughs> I love you too, Victor. Oh, and, oh, and let's not forget Victor. Victor, I what? I used to call Victor so much. Oh my God, he was. Oh my. oh my God, he was spot on. Yeah, Victor, thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, See, I didn't cry. Right. <laughs> thank you, Tina. Um, and thank everybody. Uh, what, I, what I want people to understand here is that that pain is real, but these folks are taking that pain and, and harvesting the energy and directing it in the right direction to lead the movement. And so we, we, we pay homage to you folks for being as strong as you are. And I know you, you don't want to admit that, but as activists who witness it, um, we have nothing but gratitude. So thank you. Um, so Wait, Petra's waiting. we have Petra. Are you ready? Um, okay. Yeah, on that, last, on that last question of how can this community support impacted families at this time and how do we center families in the movement? I am, um, one of the things that I was gonna say is like, if you're gonna be an organizer, I think knowing who these families are um is important in knowing who there's what you know at least some type of background to their story when you're going to bring them forth um you know because i've been i've been to somewhere i've been invited and then the organizer didn't know who i was so i kind of walked up and i was kind of lost <laughs> a little bit <laughs> for a while you know and um and then you know mm -hmm. like if you're um you know if you're a 
the community support, I think in Las Vegas, one of the things that I find having been here is that um, that the it, we're very transient and we're very fast paced here. And so the community moves from one thing to another very quickly. Um, you know, we don't have a, a large and long attention span on items here. Um, and because we're a 24 hour town too. And I think one of the, the lacking part of this community is like the support systems in place for family members. Like it's very hard to find somebody. Um, I think I mentioned, uh, I was had talked about um, victims of crime where if you are the, if your family member is murdered, you have the opportunity to apply to this and you have the opportunity to get help and they give references. But the minute you say, well, my, my, uh, the murder was caused by a justify, it was a justified murder by a police department. There's complete silence. You don't qualify for anything. And then there's no resources um, made available to families in the community. There's nobody who under, you know, there's no therapist to find. Um, there's no, you know, there's no, nobody who really understands it to be able to say, hey, I need help here. The financial, you know, nobody talks about the financial calamity it, it can cause you um, because, you know, you're so focused on certain things at the time. And then finally, at one point, you realize your, your financial, your whole life has changed and there's no resources for that, that family. There's nothing. There's nothing directed towards children, um, you know, and so... And I've heard, I've heard even in the uh, at the, the items that I've panels that I've attended here, where I've talked to some of the police chiefs, they always say, "Yes, yes, you know, we understand. They'll write it down, and it's just like very typical, write it down, and then who knows where it goes because um, nothing ever changes." And the same with um, uh, hitting assemblymen, congressmen, they they sit, they listen to you, but they're scared. They're they're scared to call on the power in the city here. You know they're scared to challenge it and so it makes it very hard on us in this community for, uh, for sure when it comes to las vegas and i and i think that um you know it's kind of there but it's kind of that really very loud silence that we all hear that there's there's they're they're acknowledging you but not really you know and um so you know i think some of those items are what i would see in changing a community definitely in uh, getting some alliance with some people who are in, um, you know, uh, political figures, but definitely finding finding the ability to create resources for families because at the end of the day, there's um, there's just you know again like nothing until you find a group, but um, or until you find people who can reach with you, and uh, but for my especially for children, you know, I uh, I think. That the hardest thing was was dealing with the kids, um, you know, and because because you're you're fighting to save them now after everything happens, because trauma like this, in the first thing that you see um, people want to do is get away from it and hide from it, and you know they want to they want to escape it, and so you know. Um, I had to fight for my children. I had to fight to bring them back. And I had to fight to keep them from entering into a different world. And, um, you know, I, I didn't want to see them be, be lost to substance abuse or, you know, alcoholism or any other, other things that, um, you know, we can, you know, people use to escape. And so, you know, to have resources and to have aid and to have something in place, that to me would make this, make, make it the biggest support for impacted families. Thank you so much for that, Petra. Uh, Victor, you want to add something? Good? Yeah, I want to add before we go. I appreciate you, Oja and Nisa. <laughs> Thank for you. real. I love you guys, man. For real, Thank for real. Thank you, love you too, man. You love guys all keep us on our toes. And everybody that's watching, I really need you to understand how much Nisa and Oja means to us as a whole. Yeah. They yeah. have been with us Definitely. day in, day out. They piss me off most of the time. <laughs> they they annoy me. <laughs> but it's honestly for all good reasons. So with these shout outs, I'm not I refuse to end this call without letting you guys know that I love the both of you. I appreciate you guys. And I'm always I'm, I'm for, for real. I don't think I tell you that enough. The media stuff that you guys put together, you guys put this together in two days. And you guys are way savvier than I am. So I don't know what I would do without the two of you. So thank you both.
We love I think you. We can, I think we can all agree with him. Uh, yes. Thank you. Ditto. Yeah. Yes. Thank you guys so much. Love you guys. Um, thank you. We love, love you, too, you too. Definitely. I mean, it, I just want to let people out there know that, I mean, it just wouldn't be possible, obviously, without the families um, and the energy and the beautiful things that we witness when we get the opportunity to be around y'all, being with each other, you know what I mean? Um, it's truly inspiring. And it's something that I would really implore people who are concerned about this issue, are concerned about human rights in general, universal human rights, to really get involved with in the correct way, being the operative part of what I'm saying, in the correct way. Contact these organizations for family members. If you're thinking about using a family member's image or the image of a loved one, reach out to the family. These folks are human beings. They exist. They're accessible. There are organizations that you can reach folks at. Um, on our Facebook, once again, I see you, Petra. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be right with you. Um, on our Facebook page, the Force Trajectory Project, once again, you can scroll down. You'll see the, the flyer that includes everyone on it. But we also, are not, not even we, NISA put together the flyers for the, the specific region. So each organization and family member has their own flyer. Please go to the Facebook page. Check for a flyer that um, involves a family member and an organization that is in your region and reach out, get in contact. We also will be accepting comments and questions. This is just the beginning of this conversation and we obviously have access to the family members who were on the panel. So if there's a comment or a question that you have following this presentation, please leave that in the video comment section of the Facebook page by the Facebook Live. Yes. Oh, and then also I wanted to, you know, I've been talking to a lot of uh, families um, that weren't on the panel and that wanted to be on the panel and um, you know, my question to impact of families is, is this a panel that you want to see us doing, especially now because of what's happening, um, you know, in the next coming weeks, should we, maybe we do it weekly and we get new families in and learn their stories. Um, is that something that you'd be interested in doing? Is that what you want to see? If you're not a family member, is that something you want to see? Um, and then if you are a family member, is that something that you want to be a part of? So, you know, let us know in the comments. Um, you can also, uh, get us on Instagram, you can get us on Facebook, Check. you can email us, forcedtrajectory at gmail.com. Um, and yeah, so we definitely want to, we, our, our goal in this work is to center families because families are impacted, they need support. Um, they're, they're, I mean, I've never met anybody stronger than the families that I've met. That's just the honest truth. They go through so much, they have so much resilience and they have so much wisdom for this movement. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Okay, Petra. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for inviting me to be on the panel. And I wanted to take the opportunity to also thank, like, um, you know, because I haven't had much of a chance o over this past four years to really say thank you to the ladies of Indian Ed who um, held me up during that time because uh, I volunteer for the Indian Education Committee for um, Clark County School District. and those ladies came together and they did, they did hold me up as much as they possibly could. I'm sure it was a very heavy thing to, to try um, because my, you know, we were so buried in this and then I have, um, you know, my kids and my extended family and, um, you know, my, uh, I have some really good friends. I want to, I just want to say thank you to them. Uh, some of them are on here because, um, you know, it was, uh, you know, prior to those moments, I don't know if I could have made it to, to meeting these people, you know, because there were, there were moments where I just didn't know if I was going to survive myself. And so, um, I just want to take an opportunity to thank everybody. And uh, Nisa, I am, I am so blessed and I am so grateful that I, that I met you through uh, my son and that, um, you know, that I could, that especially the day I ran into you in the parking lot and we stood and talked, I think that was the day when I realized, um, I, I felt more comfortable about coming together. So with others, other families. So I'm, I'm very grateful for that. And um, I just wanted to, to give a, take the chance to say thank you to everybody who was there for me and my family. Thank you so much and thank everybody. Does anybody else have something to say before we close up? All right, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna do a say his name, say her name. And um, I'll just call Sorry. them out. Yeah, Victor. 
Uh, I'm back. I do got one more thing. Sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah, yeah, nah, good. Um, I'm going to send uh, you guys the flyer to, uh, not even the flyer, post. Um, I know earlier today I kept talking about organizing the organizers. That is real. Yeah. We are doing it in New York City. Yeah. I've already posted on my Facebook page trying to re to get all of the organizers together. And for anybody who's watching, I just want to say I'm not trying to take a hierarchy role with this. I just would like to get all the organizers in the area, I don't care if they're national, and be on the equal level playing field. Messaging is so important now. So any organizers watching, anybody who knows organizers watching, please go to the Facebook page, send it around. I'm trying to organize something and maybe have a meeting by Friday. That way we can get all the messaging centered. And the messaging will be based around families, but not only us. Like I said, community members are suffering in other ways as well. So we do want to put those things together and have a united front. That's what we're here for. So please, folks, follow us, get in line. Uh, I mean, follow us, get online, uh, look for us. And any organizers out there, reach out, man. We, it's, it's time to put some work in. Thank you for that, brother. Anybody else? I'm All right. So at this time, um, we're going to do the say his name or say her name. And um, let's let's do it like this so it's a little bit more kept, uh, you know, coordinated and in rhythm. Basically, I'll say say her, say his name or say her name, then we'll say the name, then I'll say it again, then we'll say the name, right? We'll do that three times. I know before we got it a little twisted, but I want everybody out there in the audience right now, even though we can't hear you, you know, with whoever you're sheltered with or whatever's going on, definitely join us in this in this ritual of holding up those who have had their lives stolen um, because they're with us, they walk with us, we honor them every day. And that's what this is about, is, is universal human rights and justice. These are the leaders of our struggle and we wanna continue to lift you up in any way possible. I think you already know, but if you need anything uh, that we can supply in any way, definitely reach out and we'll be here. Uh, you know how to do that. For everybody else, you can reach us through our social media handles. It's all Force Trajectory Project or Force Trajectory. Um, look for it. You'll find it. Send us a message. We will get back to you. And on that note, say his name, Rex Wilson. Say his name, Rex, Rex Wilson. Wilson. Say his name, Rex, Rex, Wil Rex Wilson. Rex Wilson. Rex say his Wilson. name. Rex, Rex, Wilson. Rex Wilson. Say her name. Charlene Lyles. Charlene Lyles. Charlene. Charlene Lyles. Say her name. Charlene Lyles. Charlene Lyles. Say her name. Charlene Lyles. Charlene Lyles. Say his name. Corey Jones. Corey Jones. Corey Jones. Say his name. Corey Jones. Say Corey, 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 Corey Jones. Okay, Corey, so let's say, say your name in the I'm going to say it twice. I'm going to say it twice. I'm going to say, say his name. Say his name. Boom. All right? One, two, one, two. All right, ready? One more time for Corey. Say his name. Corey Jones. Say his name. Say his name. Corey, Corey, Corey Jones. Jones. All right. Say his name. Delron Small. Say his name. Delron Del Small. Del Ron Small. Mm -hmm. Say his name, Delron Del Small. Small. <laughs> Say his name. Delron Small. Delron Small. I give y'all a visual. I feel like, yeah, all right, don't, don't worry about it. I'm going to point. Y'all ready? Say his name, Michael Barrera. Say his name. Say his name. Michael Barrera. There you go. Say his name, Michael Barrera. Michael Barrera. Say his name, Michael Barrera. Michael Barrera. Okay, say her name, Adesha Miller. Say her name, Adesha Miller. Miller. Say her name, Adesha Miller. Say her I name, name. Adesha Miller. Miller. You got it. Say her name, Adesha Miller. Say her name, Adesha Miller. Miller. All right. All right. <laughs> say her name, Sandra Bland. Say her name, say her name. Sandra, Sandra Bland. 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 Say her name, Sandra 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 Bland. All right. Say his name, Gary Hopkins Jr.
Say his name. Gary, Gary Hopkins, Hopkins Jr. Jr. Say his name. Gary Hopkins Jr. Say his name. Say his name. Gary Hopkins Jr. Jr. Say his name. Gary Hopkins Jr. Say his name. Gary, Gary Hopkins, Hopkins Jr. Jr. All right. All right. One more time. Say his name. Sean Bell. Say his name. Sean, Sean Bell. 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 Say his name. Sean Bell. Say his name. Sean Bell. Sean Bell. Bell. Say his name. Sean Bell. Say his name. Sean Bell. Sean Bell. Bell. Sean Bell. Right. Thank you all so much. Um, definitely reach out. Let us know. Uh, any questions, comments, concerns? If you want to do this again, marinate on it. We don't need the answer right now. Let us know. Thank you guys so much. It's great to see you. For those of you we haven't seen for so long, and we love y'all. Keep the fight. Love y'all. You guys. Thank you guys, Thank you guys so much. much. Right. Thank you everyone Thank you for coming on. Yes, Take care, guys. Thank you. Love you guys. Bye. Bye. Love. Peace. Bye.